officially known now as COVID-19. The total number of confirmed cases in China has surpassed 70,000. The death toll now reached over 1,700, while over 11,000 people have recovered. Here are the latest developments on the virus. The majority of confirmed cases in China are in the Hubei province. In fact, 70 percent are in the provincial capital, Wuhan, where the outbreak began. On Monday, newly confirmed cases outside Hubei were down 90 percent compared to their peak on February 3rd. A hospital in Wuhan has completed autopsies on the bodies of two patients who died of the virus. Medical researchers are now reviewing the pathogen reports. Chinese health authorities say the country has taken effective measures to contain the outbreak of the virus. Though the disease is new, it is preventable and curable. The daily new cases outside Hubei have dropped for consecutive 13 days. These signal that the measures we took are very effective. I believe we will summarize a set of strategies and methods to increase the recovery rate. Not only China, but also the international community can take advantage of those experiences. Meanwhile, in China, more businesses have reopened. A freight train has left Zhengzhou for Central Asia, marking the resumption of the China-Europe freight trains in the city. And now I'm joined by Professor Zhang Linqi from the Department of the Basic Medical Sciences from the School of Medicine with Tsinghua University. Professor Zhang, thank you so much for sharing your precious time out of your very, very busy schedule recently. How are you supporting the front line? And meanwhile, how are you doing your research regarding the antibody and vaccines? Uh, over the last several years, uh, my group and then Dr. Wang's and Xiang's group at Tsinghua University, we, we, we have been focused our research activity to understand how viruses get into cells. By understanding that processes, we could develop a good drugs and antibodies and vaccines to stop that process. So based on our understanding of this process, we are now using the genetic and the recombination technologies to develop uh, several vaccine strategies. Hopefully by using those strategies and immunize individuals, we are able to induce the antibody responses able to stop the viral infection. So that's actually the prime purpose of our current research on campus. Is on the other hand, during this, Go ahead. during this processes, we also developed a crucial immunological testing that helped the frontline physicians to evaluate the plasma and the blood immune reactivity mm. so they could use as a surrogate marker to evaluate the potential effectiveness of, of the plasma infusion studies to treat most severe patients at frontline. Talking about plasma, this is the key word recently in terms of therapeutic treatment. Now, that process has been used in many uh, cases earlier in treating different kinds of diseases. But whether do we know or not, this is likely to work. According to the latest situation, we have 11 so-called successful cases within 24 hours. But is that big enough to support this argument? Uh, this is a very important area of investigation. Uh, for this particular coronavirus, we are not certain whether or to what extent is uh, effective. So that require a systematic and comprehensive research. That's why we are providing the support to evaluate the immune status of that plasma, try to correlate that with the effectiveness of treatment. Mm. In fact, this concept of using plasma to treat infectious diseases back to almost 100 years ago, yes. And when the German scientist uh, Emil von Behren developed the uh, antiserum of plasma against the uh, diphtheria, uh, so he actually the first winner of a uh, Nobel Prize in uh, medicine and, and then, and then in, in medicine, but because of his idea and concept developed of uh, equivalent plasma 
treatment for infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. In fact, during the outbreak of many other um, viral infection, including Ebola and then highly pathogenic influenza, some anecdotes experiment has been conducted in humans, but the size and also the conclusive uh, conclusion have not been re reached. Yeah. So given the, the size of the severe infected patients now in China, we are, have uh, this unique and then uh, good opportunity to address that in the most scientific uh, manner. So we could reach a firm conclusion based on those uh, important studies. Uh, Professor Zhang, now we understand more than 10,000 people, according to the latest information, recovered. But the question really is, what is the ratio, Professor? There's a crucial issue like this about, uh, you know, how much uh, plasma being used can be for the treatment of how many patients, or vice versa. Uh, do we know, uh, is there any statistics that we have collected, whether this is going to be a resource effective? This is a really great question, because if we depend on those natural resources, we're going to be very limited. But at present, uh, given what we have practiced over the years, uh, for a donor, if you are a convalescent recovered patient, you are encouraged to donate uh, plasma or blood for the severe for treatment of severe patient. For each one donation, someone could donate several hundreds of uh, mills, and then you could use that and then after a certain treatments and then of this plasma samples to remove some potential harmful materials and to activate uh, viruses, those samples can be infused directly into patients. Mm. Maybe with ranging from 200 to, to, to more uh, meals. But as I said, those uh, are dependent on the natural resources of convalescent patients mm. are quite limited. That's why in our research field, we have been collaborating with the partners in Beijing, in Shenzhen, and in many other places, try to isolate those antibodies from the recovered patients so we could use molecular core method mm -hmm. and also production facility to manufacturers, kilogram, even tons of those antibodies. That will overcome the short, the shortness needs of right. uh, convalescent serum from patients. There's another thing regarding plasma because we had earlier public health emergencies or accidents uh, when people donate their blood and they have the plasma uh, separated from the blood cells and eventually they have the, uh, once again, their, the rest of the blood coming back to their body, just it's going to help the, those who have donated the blood, but eventually became a public health accident. We remember that very well concerning the AIDS patients years ago. So, uh, Professor Zhang, at this critical moment, everybody is rushing for solutions. How important it is that we take care of different size of the same issue? Those are really good points. When, when the emergency happens, we tend to be over, overly act, and then during this rushness, we may make some mistakes. But we have to be very, very vigilant about safety first. Safety, safety, safety. Once we have collected the convalescent serum or plasma from those patients, those plasma will have to be treated properly according to the protocol that has been used in the field for years. Mm -hmm. So safety precautions is, is a must. So do, given what we have been conducting and knowing all these years, the safety procedure have already been in place. And I am sure that many of the hospitals and physicians that are conducting those trials have put the safety first on top of the list. But you know, as you may know, COVID-19 is a very infectious disease. Uh, we have seen it easily be infectious from one to the other. So uh, medical workers at different departments of a hospital have to protect themselves because they also need to protect their patients because once they are infected, they're going to spread it to the others too. So how to keep that balance? On the one hand, you want to make sure there's medical support to the people with long-term disease. But on the other hand, you want to make sure uh, all the medical workers as well as patients seeking, pa seeking treatment in the hospitals can be safe. This is quite a dilemma. 
Absolutely. I think at this emergency cases, in particular, we are not understanding, or we, we, we don't understand fully how this virus transmits so viciously. So everybody has to be in precaution to prevent themselves and to prevent from their patients to be infected. This is entirely new viruses to us, and we don't know how it is infected. So it is better for all of us to be, to be on guard and to be fully cautious and protect themselves, and then to minimize the chance of transmission. Mm. Certainly, it is an added burden to everyone, I see. in particular in the hospital setting. We know, Professor Zhang, that mm -hmm. the WHO expert team is now in China, not only including those coming from WHO headquarters, but also those from different parts of the world, from different countries. Mm -hmm. If you were on that team, as a medical worker or as a health expert, what do you think are some of the priorities the team should focus on? Um, I think if I were on the team, I would really look at the um, public health measure that China has put into place and also how effective that measure in containing the, the epidemic. So that's the first priority. The second priority was to see how the Chinese physicians and healthcare providers has been providing those medical care to those unfortunately infected. How effective that is, and then so, so they could learn the lesson from the Chinese experiences. Third, I would look at the the the, the research activity and also the the. The, uh, the Chinese experience, how much of those will be applicable to the international community so we could providing better walls and, and then preventions of uh, prevention measures uh, uh, to stop this virus to, to spread into other countries. In fact, last week in Geneva, WHO held this research roadmap right. for this disease, including many areas but basically boil it down to how much we know about this virus uh, transmission, what are the diagnostic treatment experience that China has gained, which could be useful and then applicable to the outside China, and the development effective vaccines, and as well as improve the communication skills, because there's so many informations bombarded to the society, people don't know which ones are correct or which are which are are simply rumors, yeah. and then and then lastly, they want to they encourage the study on the societal impact uh, on by the virus on this on, on the society, on the mental health, on our living behaviors. So all those things come together would be the WHO's team to look at. I'm sure many of the achievements that we made will will be applicable to the international com community. Mm -hmm. Professor Zhang, my last question for you. Now, if you look at the numbers, confirmed cases are still up, even though the growth rate has been slowing down. Meanwhile, you have about uh, 10,000 recovered already from the very beginning of the outbreak until now. Uh, what is the current stage, if you can share with us your insights and predictions about the overall outbreak. And also, uh, what does this mean when China, which is becoming the epicenter, if we think about the world, the epicenter of the world of this outbreak, uh, what about uh, the other places? Is this going to continue to the other places now? Uh, Professor Zhang, what's your assessment? Um, I mean, prediction for infectious disease is always very, very difficult. It Although is. there's a lot of model uh, floating around, giving the numbers that really try to predict situations. Um, so uh, it, it is hard to start with, but it's a, it is it is a it is a it is a good to know that the rate of increase has been slowed down a little bit. But I wouldn't be too complacent about it because. Given the number of the infected people in Wuhan, that's the epicenter of this epidemic, yeah. and given the number of severe cases, in particular, given the new hospitals have been built, and a lot of people need to be transferred, the logistic difficulties combined, we still have a long way to go before we see the turning point of this epidemic. So we have to be fully prepared and fully vigilant and fully 
uh, worked uh, worked uh, as hard as we we could to contain this disease. So there will be a quite well before we see the deflection point of this epidemic. Mm -hmm. So the light at the end of the tunnel is still a bit far. Is that what you're trying to say, Professor? Yes, we are confident we will win this uh, war against the virus, but we have to be well prepared before we get there. And then I think uh, combining these tougher measures in terms of quarantine isolation to break down the viral transmission rule yeah. and also boost up the medical care services to those severely affected, in particular by guarding up the research on the vaccine treatments and, and drugs that will eventually put this virus into its own place. So hopefully this will come sooner than later. Professor Zhang Wenqi, thank you so much for joining us. I learned a lot. All the best to you and your team. Thank you. Looking forward to that result. Thank you very much.